Let's go. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. I'm your host, David Horsager. Join me as I sit down with influential leaders from around the world to discuss why leaders and organizations fail, top tactics for high performance, and how you can become an even more trusted leader. Hello, it's David Horsager, and this is the Trusted Leader Show. Today, I've got a dear friend as a guest. He's an author. He's a culture expert. He speaks a lot around the world. He's also sports director of Channel 5, and we're just thrilled to have him. Thanks for being on with me, Joe Schmidt. All right, David. It's, a, it's an honor to be on there, and, uh, and uh, it's always fun to see you and work with you. Joe, you're, you're, you're a, an amazing guy. You've had an impact. Um, certainly in our part of the world and everybody knows you here kind of a local celebrity but you've also taken your message and research and work with your books and speaking all around the world let's get away from that for a second and just like hey people don't know joe uh just give us a couple things a little background a couple minutes Okay. Well, I've been a television sports anchor uh, pretty much all my life. I've been at KSTP TV in the Twin Cities here for 33 years now. So, uh, holy kind of cow, you're old. Yeah. You are. I think I'm the reason nobody ever wins championships in here, in Minnesota, <laughs> <laughs> except for the Lynx. But, uh, you know, I'm a really lucky guy. It, it's something I wanted to do. And along the way, I started speaking to different rotaries and athletic banquets and things like that. And I started telling stories about people who make an impact. And then it became my passion, my mission to study people who make an impact and why they do. And that's that became my area of expertise. And I've taken it now to the whole building world class cultures. And Joe, your your book that uh, did really well, and I gave copies of these. Many of you have seen. Those of you that are watching, it was Silent Impact, and it's a, a, a just a great book. Your newer book is uh, all about the framework or the the impact blueprint, and we're going to touch on that. Before we do, I want to bring up a quote from you that I love, and I want you to respond to it. You said. We make our biggest impressions when we're not trying to be impressive. Yes. And I tell stories about that and go and research the impact 20, 30 years later. And I think if we look at our own lives, when we've had impact on somebody or somebody's had an impact on us, it was just because we happened to be at the right place at the right time and said the right thing. And uh, it, it's not that we're trying to be heroes, but usually when you try to be impressive, you put on your Sunday suit and you get ready to roll, you're not impressing anybody. But where you're really impressive is when nobody's really watching you or expecting you to act that way. And, uh, and it's amazing to me how many great leaders have this quality and sometimes how many failed leaders do not have this quality. Tell me about this. You, you've interviewed some of the greats in the world, in our part of the world. I can remember you, uh, you know, with the microphone in front of our great Kirby Puckett and uh, a host of others along the way, Maurer, and, and going back and going forward. But tell, me, uh, tell us about one or two of those. Uh, first from the sports world, then we might jump to even the corporate world. But, but uh, who's, who's an impact player, as you see it, that made a difference 20 years later? Well, um, I've been lucky enough. I've, I've interviewed uh, one-on-ones with Tiger Woods, Muhammad Ali, Wayne Gretzky, Michael Jordan, and on and on. So I've been very fortunate that way. But the, the story that always resonates with me is Joe Mauer, who is a six-time All-Star, three-time batting champ, AL MVP. Well, when he was in high school, he walked a, a special needs student who was blind to the lunchroom. And what I did is I went back and 20 years later, I found all the guys who sat around that table and they told the stories and the impact it had. And Dave, you don't even know this yet, but recently I videotaped, I brought Joe and this Mike Hawley back together in the same high school, in the same lunchroom at the same table, brought them together, had them sit down and talk about the impact it had on each other's lives. And it's really compelling, powerful stuff. And to take it one step further, this is the way silent impact works. You know, how we make our biggest impressions when we're not trying to be impressive. A young woman got the book Silent Impact, read that Joe Maurer story, and because of it, she was struggling. She had, she had her, fa- her grandfather had just died of suicide. Uh, she was really struggling what to do. She started a nonprofit called Thumbs Up for Mental Health. She's working with high schools all over Minnesota right now. We're using that video 
to to do a video called No One Eats Alone using Joe Maurer and this story in the reunion as the basis of it. You know, that that speaks to something I've never shared, I don't think, uh, on the podcast, but my we moved when my daughter was in seventh grade. Um, and I think I if, if I got this right from her, the first day she sat down at lunch, uh, the whole group of girls she sat by got up and left and she was alone. And part of her first uh, several months at that high school were, or school were alone and of course she's uh, amazing uh, now and become great and we love her through it and she has a very high eq today but those were some lonely tough times uh you know and i actually i still see that in adults today people you go to a, events you go to receptions people don't know how like they're over alone in the corner there's a lot of people alone out there what can we do just in our work and in our world what's one way we could be more intentional. Leaders could be more intentional about making a silent impact. Well, first of all, I think it's an awareness. You have to be aware. And what I have uh, worked with leaders, I say, schedule yourself 15 minutes a day or every other day and call it impact time. And the impact time is really just to go check on people. How are you doing? Ask one more question. Not how was your weekend? It was fun. What did you do? I went fishing. Where'd you go? I went up to Malax. Were you catching walleye up there? All of a sudden, you make a relationship that's deeper and more meaningful, and you let these people know your fellow employees, whether they're higher on the food chain or lower on the food chain from you, you that you really care. Because all these different generations in the workplace right now, I don't care if whether you're 17 or 77, everybody wants to be acknowledged and feel valued. And if you're a leader, that's your number one job. Wow. Talk to me about that. T tell me, jump into the traits. You know, in the blueprint, you've got all these traits of, of leaders that are making an impact. What's a, what's a favorite trait we could talk about right now? Well, how about trust? <laughs> Give me <a> <laughs> I like it. I, I do have trust in there, and I quote you in, my, in the Impact Blueprint. And the Impact Blueprint has 52 traits of people who make an impact. And then there's a little story in each one and then something to do. But I would say... Besides trust, I think the number one issue is communication. You know, how are you communicating? You need to listen with your eyes, not with your ears. You need to listen to learn, not listen to respond. I think too many people in a conversation, they're listening to say, now, what am I going to say next to make me feel smart? Listen to learn and listen to ask questions. You don't want to be the kind of person I always I always tease. I said, I, I've got a couple of friends who will say, you know, now that I've talked about me for the last half hour, why don't you talk about me for the next <laughs> half hour? <laughs> exactly. But communication, you know that, David, that you I mean in, in trust. Tell me that communication is not high in that food chain. Absolutely. You know, it, it weaves through all of them. And it's often the what's trusted is the type, right? The clear communication, compassionate communication, you know, consistent communication and so forth. So let's let's jump in here. I, you know, you've become in, in all your time interviewing greats and in all your time working with companies and you've had some significant impact with companies on their culture. Let's jump into culture for a few moments. You you talk about these three areas of making a great culture, but uh, you know, w give us an example of a great culture. Okay, um, one of my companies that I worked with is Anytime Fitness, and Anytime Fitness promises every employee you will never miss a monumental moment of your life. That's their first promise to you. So what they're telling you is they care about you. Because when I work on, I call it the culture first mindset, there are three areas we work on, compassion, connection, and clarity. You have to let people know you care. And that's one way they do. I worked with a uh, with a, a small title company that had five different outlets um, throughout the Midwest. And when they brought people together, I went to one of the manager's meetings and the CEO started off with a profit and loss statement. I said, I said, you got it all wrong. You're not letting your people know you care. You're letting them know you care about money, that you really don't care about them. Just get me a lot of money. And uh, we changed the whole perspective. They celebrate everything right now. Everybody, you know, if, if somebody's kid wins a little league tournament on Monday, everybody knows it because they celebrate it. He starts off meetings. Now, I gave him this advice and, and I use this quite often. I said, don't start off your meeting with profit and loss statements. Start off your meeting with a question of the day. What's the best concert you ever went to? 
and you go around the room and everybody gives 30 seconds. Well, all of a sudden across the table, you find out that this person you've worked with for the last 10 years is a huge Rolling Stones fan too. And you were at the same concert. That's called the connection. It makes you dive a little bit deeper into that connection. You can ask questions. And guess what? The next time the Stones are in concert we're in your town, you might go together. That's the way it works out. I love it. What, what, uh, when you take culture, I, I, we talk about this a lot, but it's all of these things, I, I'm just thinking about this right now because I was in the boardroom yesterday on a significant deep project with senior leaders of a publicly traded company. And we're talking about trust and the, we're talking about how do they get it from their team. But they're like, well, what about them? They're, what about them being committed to us? What about them connecting with us? What about the, what about our employees? And we have such a, you know, such a, such a talent challenge of retention and uh, attrition right now. And yet I do see the challenge because around that boardroom, you get all these people that got to answer to the stakeholders that are talking profit loss and they're talking all these things, but uh, marry those together for a little bit. So people see the value? Well, first of all, I think a company has to realize that there is a gap. Every company has a gap, no, no matter how good you think your culture is. And here's the gap. The gap is the culture you have and the culture you strive for. And what are you doing to fill that gap? And, and that's when it comes down to the three C's. So what are you doing to make better connections? What are you doing to let people know that it's actually people over profits? And guess what? When you put people over profits, you know what the byproduct is? Profits, wild success, fantastic customer service, people who will want to stay there. David, when in our research, when people look for a job today, 60% of the people, before they even fill out an application, look at the values and the culture of that company before they even apply. You need to have a culture plan within your organization. And if you don't have a culture plan, it's if you got a financial plan, you got a crisis management plan, you know, in our personal lives, we got vacation plans, we got wedding plans, we got funeral plans. Do you have a culture plan? If, yeah, yeah. Let, let's start. We, we, we're, we're known for here. Here's my, uh, you know, this is why I do podcast free consulting, right? So, um, so let's create a culture plan. How would I do that? At least give us a, give us a little, let's, let's create a plan. We got our companies, people are listening. Thing, um, instead of talking about how, how do I do it, how do I even start creating a culture plan? Okay, the first thing you do is you work with your team and you get your team to realize I have to look inwardly first. Um, I started this. I'm gonna. I'm gonna have. I got. I'm gonna show this. I started this uh, thing that I call the triple play because I think everybody needs to do a self examination of how they are either helping or hurting the culture of their company. And here's the triple play, David. What are you gonna stop? What are you gonna start? And what are you gonna continue? with the culture and then under each one you put down the three whys or the three results because of that so so for for example for me my stop is sarcasm i tend to think everything's funny and i can be sarcastic well underneath sarcasm things i have to stop and the reason i have to stop is one in sarcasm there's there's a shred of truth. Two, some people don't have a, a sense of humor, won't understand it. Three, you can hurt people without, without even realizing it with sarcasm. So then what am I going to start doing? I'm going to schedule impact time. 15 minutes every day, I'm going to reward progress. I'm going to find out how people are doing. Guess what? I'm going to acknowledge them and tell, you, tell them that they're valuable. You know, our, our mutual friend, Mike McKinley, you know, he used to do a bit on the stage where he said uh, where he said, you know, nobody ever quit a job because they, they were getting pat on the back too often. You know, yeah. nobody ever quit a job. They quit a job because they feel underappreciated. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But they'd never quit a job when they feel appreciation. Yeah. And what are you going to continue? What am I going to continue? I'm going to continue praising heavily. Um, I started I started doing it a few years back. You know, sometimes. Dave, you're a hundred percent go, go, go guy, right? And, and I'm the same way. So sometimes we expect everybody to be the same way we are. Well, guess what? Some people work at a different pace and some people work at a, at a different level. It was interesting. I, I, my sports background, I uh, sat down with Bud Grant 
uh, about a year ago and and Bud and I were just talking and I said to Bud, I said, Bud, what what leadership work for you? And if, if you don't know who Bud Grant is, Bud was a legendary Hall of Fame coach for the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, he led them to four Super Bowls. Unfortunately, they lost all four Super Bowls, but Bud was a great leader. And Bud said, he got to know his people. That was his most important job. And he said, I had to know who I could yell at in front of the team. I had to know who I had to bring behind closed doors. I had to know who I needed to kick in the butt. And I had to know who I put my arm around and say, it'll be better next time. And he said, once I learned that, leadership became a lot easier. So stop, start, continue. Think about that, how you can figure out how to make different people click. So we do that. That's stage one. Look more, look inwardly first, and it's stop, start, continue. Yeah. Simple, actionable, powerful. How how many steps are there? Well, well, then then so so what happens is I have not made this. One thing I decided originally when I was doing this, I was going to do it just like you do a strategic plan. You'd have objectives, you have dates, all this. Kind of, and all of a sudden I realized nobody wants that because that's wordsmithing. That's that's where you get down where, you know, you put it in the file and two years later we dig out the strategic plan. So what I do with the companies I work with is I tell them, let's all agree on a tenant. A tenant is a principle or a belief that people live by. This is not a wordsmith belief. For example, one of the companies I just worked with, it's a, a company that is a 911 company throughout the world. Basically what, you know, with everybody with their cell phone now, you know, in the old days, you called 911 from your house, you could go right to your house. Well, this company sells software that you could be in the middle of the woods and call 911 and they can pinpoint where you are. So they work all over the world. And in any way, their tenant that they came out with after we worked with them for a while was we're here to help everybody flourish. Very simple, but basically it was telling you, I am here to make you better. You're here to make me better. You're here to make them better. And all of a sudden, everybody, everybody goes up. Everybody rises up. You know, our, our research said that employees want three things from a company. They want a company that cares about their people. Okay, that's pretty simple. They want a company that's successful because they don't want to worry about that company moving away. And they also want a company that cares about the community that they serve and not just by giving it, you know, you know, showing up at some event and calling it a charity event, but really digs down and cares about the community and communities they serve. Most training and development initiatives don't last or even solve the root problem hindering an organization. That's where Trust Edge certification comes in. Trust Edge certified partners are equipped with a suite of tools to identify, benchmark, and close gaps in trust for good. Because when you solve the real issue, you get measurable results and a culture where people actually want to make an impact. So whether you're a trainer, a manager, an HR executive, or a leader in learning and development, check out TrustEdgePlatform.com and see how you can start solving the root issue and get lasting results in your organization. And now back to the show. So number two, agree on a tenant. Work through a process. You lead this process. Agree, agree on a tenant. Uh, maybe we'll go just a little bit further. What's after that? Well, after that, then is the the follow up. How are we going to follow? How are we going to follow this up? What are we going to put into uh, implementation? So during during a session, we will talk about different ideas that worked for different companies. You know, we will talk about. You know, instead of doing a Zoom talk, you know, another Zoom meeting, why don't you both go for a walk and you can talk about, you know, what you're seeing on the walk. It just changes thing up. You know, everybody's having a hard time connecting, coming back into the, the real world out of the pandemic. So what are you doing to make it easier to connect? You know, I, I broadcast from home for an entire year. I'm the most social guy in the world. When I went back to KSTP for the first time, I had angst. I hadn't been back there working with people and it was like, if I have angst who kind of lets things flow off my back, imagine somebody who has angst over a lot of things, the kind of angst they had. So what are you doing to make it comfortable for people to connect? And, and you can get a lot of information and ideas just kicking it around with your people. Hmm. I love it. So here we go. We're going to do have culture first. You lead this process. It can take a lot more time than this to do it right. But look inwardly first. Think about what you're going to stop, start, continue. Sarcasm is interesting. I, um, By the way, I think, I think the Latin root of that word is dog ripping flesh. 
So Is it really? I think sorry, I, it's something like that. So uh, you know, there you go. But uh, number two was agree on a tenant. Number three is follow up on figure out the implementation process and follow up. Uh, and uh, I, I love it. There's more to it, but that's just a start. And uh, I, I really, it, it's exciting. You've got a lot more examples of where that's worked and what you've done with it, Joe. I have to jump in. So the, 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 the books are great. Silent Impact, the, the Impact Blueprint, and those traits are inspiring. You talk about culture first. I want to backstep just a little bit to all your anchoring days and continual you know, anchoring. What's a, first of all, just what's a favorite interview where you gained an idea that you could apply in impact leadership or teamwork? Oh, that's 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 a really really good question um, because sometimes it's not the biggest names that you interview that have the biggest impact. You know, sometimes it's the young kid with the eyes as big as saucers, excited to to have big goals. It's fun to watch these kids have goals, and then then you know, ten years later, they're holding the Stanley Cup. You know, and and I've witnessed that, and that and that's a, that's a very cool feeling. Um, uh, the two things come to mind. One, I'm, I'm a lot more aware and intentional when I listen to somebody talk now, especially leaders on something I can steal. Just from P.J. Fleck the other day, P.J. Fleck's the, the gopher football coach. And I asked him a question. I said, if you could major, wave a magic wand over your program, what would you add to your program that maybe another program has and you would like to have? What bigger stadium, you know, more money for recruiting? What What is it? And he said, uh, Joe, Comparisons steal your joy. I was like, that's probably been out there a long time. But I thought, you know what? Too many times we compare ourselves to other people. You know, how, how come David Horsager is talking to the government in Kenya and I'm talking to the government in, in Cambridge, Minnesota? <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, whatever. But if you do that, yeah. comparisons steal your joy. But, but I think the most impactful interview I ever had, I... I interviewed a, a coach at Northwestern College, a football coach in Roseville, Minnesota, and he was dying of cancer. Uh, and everybody knew he was dying and he was coaching till the end. And I spent three hours with him on the golf cart coaching that day. And it was my Tuesdays with Maury moment. And what I saw was amazing humility, amazing, even though he had all this impact, he always thought he could give more. And, and what was interesting is he was trying to hold on as long as he could. And I thought to myself, here's a, real, here's a good lesson to it. He wanted more. He wanted more impact. He wanted more memories. He wanted to, to, to get more knowledge to his kids. I went to his funeral, and guess what? His kids, his team, his former players, they wanted more, too. They wanted more from him. And I thought, okay, we always can do more. We know that. Don't beat ourselves up over it when we don't do it. But when we have the opportunity, let's do it. And that's that awareness and intentionality that I talk about. It has to become part of your DNA. I mean, and that's hard to say because we all make mistakes. We're all human. We all get too busy. But if you put it forefront, that's why the impact resolutions I do, that would be another step along the process where every month you take a different value or trait and you concentrate on it. It's just a way to. So, for example, my impact resolution, I have it right here at my desk. So I see it every day. It's uh, when we put in a camera grind and focus. Those are the two things I'm concentrating on this month. Now, when the month ends, I will put up another impact resolution. But every day I look at that. I realize keep grinding and focus because we can easily get distracted and mm -hmm. by the shiny object. Yep. Absolutely. As an interviewer, what what's what's a favorite question you ask? I, I remember asking what it was insightful, like fun to come back to my head right now because I don't talk to that many media folks, but I did got to ask uh, before he passed away Larry King this question. It was it kind of gave me a mind shift, but you've interviewed so many greats. What's a favorite question? Uh, th th that's a really good question itself. Um, for, first of all, the best interviewers listen, so you can you're you're not 
thinking about the next question. You're listening, and then it becomes more of a conversation uh, than a question. I have a I have a default question that I use that in case I'm not getting anywhere, I'll I'll ask an athlete to describe himself as an athlete, so then they can talk a little bit. But but I think the idea is one of the great questions you can ask is is all the work you did on the journey, has it been worth it? Because anybody who has had any success at all, uh, there's a journey. It's kind of funny. Once in a while, you'll hear about some guy being an overnight success. Maybe it's a comedian. Maybe it's an athlete. Well, they don't realize that for 15 years, they were working their craft like crazy to become that overnight success. So everybody has a journey. And what did you do on that journey? And, and how did you push through the tough times when people didn't believe in you and maybe you didn't believe in yourself? And which kind of leads me to, to, to when we did we did research on the best bosses. And you're going to like this one, David, because it falls into your category. So we did research. Who is the best boss? And we found out that the best bosses are tough, but fair. And that equals trust. Mm -hmm. How about that? So, so what that boss did is that boss saw something in you that you didn't see in yourself. So they pushed you. You're not going to waste your time on somebody who doesn't have potential to take their game to the next level. So that boss saw something in you. And one of the, one of the other exercises I, I do quite often is, is the, uh, the Mount Rushmore of influence, where you know if you had to name the four most impactful people in your life, who would be on your list and why would you be there? It, it's just another reason to, to another way to be more aware and intentional with your impact. And there's very often that a former boss will be on there. And guess what? The boss was tough, but fair, and they trusted him. Hmm. That's a, so true. I think of the coaches I've had, the teachers I've had, the, you know, tough but fair. They're not going to waste they're not going to waste time on you if you're not worth helping or saving. And and uh, so so I think it, it, it's always interesting. The other thing that I think I learned for, through interviewing people is there are different styles that work and different styles work. Sometimes the hard guy works, sometimes the nice guy works, but through it all. You better let them know you care. You bet they better be clear on the clarity. Clarity is the catalyst for growth. You better be crystal clear on what your role is, why that role is important. And guess what? There's more than just trying to earn a paycheck every two weeks. We're trying to raise the bar. The younger generation, they want they want a reason. They, they, they want passion. They want they want something that they can do to help the world. Mm -hmm. Les, as many of you listening were at the Trusted Leader Summit, and uh, you'll recognize Joe from the summit. There's a reason we put him on stage and have an interview guests. And I think what I'm impressed by with you, Joe, is uh, we had, uh, let's see, um, an Olympian. We had a five-time um, national, the most national championships um, uh, from the WNBA and, and a few others. And you were the interviewer. But you have a way of drawing out the best in them and making them look good. And I think, you know, are, are, are giving them, give, giving them, allowing them to be their best, even if they want to share where they failed, you help them bring out their best. And, and what I love is not just their best for them, but for the audience. So the audience, you know, what they're thinking, how, how you think about what the audience would be thinking. Is there anything else there? Yeah. Well, it, I, I know we were talking Gable Stevenson, who is the NCAA wrestling champion, Olympic gold medal wrestler. He was one of the guys we brought on stage. And, uh, and it was interesting because Gable, I didn't really even ask him the question, but he went there to a failure and why he failed and what that failure did to him and changed him and made him the rock star in wrestling that he became. And, and I thought that was very, I thought that was very interesting, but believe it or not, and I'm not, I'm not saying this just because you're on the other end, but you develop a relation, relationship where people are going to trust you. I remember one time years ago, I, uh, Tommy Kramer was the quarterback of the Minnesota Vikings. You know, that's how long I go back. And uh, I, uh, Tommy was mad. We're asking him questions. He had a five interception game. And I went to Tommy. I said, Tommy, I'm going to be here when you throw five touchdown passes. And I'm going to be here when you throw five interceptions. So you might as well just get used to it, you know. But, but then trust is earned. 
And, um, and, and then that makes the conversation a lot easier. People want to tell their story. Uh, they, they do like telling their story. And I'll tell you one other thing, uh, David, and, and I think we've probably seen this in a lot of other, other inter- industries too. I became a much better sportscaster when I realized it wasn't about me. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's about the audience that we're catering to, but also about the person that I'm talking to, you know, and, and I think that's a maturity thing. Like when you first start off, you want to be on TV and Hey, look at me, I'm asking questions, you know, but, but then you kind of turn it around to, you know, how is, how is, uh, how is Lisa Horsager going to be interested in this story? You know, mm-hmm. you know, when I, when I put this story on the air, you know, so, so, so when you start thinking that way, and I think as leaders, we have to think about our audience, you know, you know, our, our vendors, our employees, our people who work for us. And, you know, how is it going to impact them? Not how am I going to look? Yep. So many leaders get up, get in there and like, I'm the leader now. I, d- I just had somebody on a board write me. It's like, I'm the now the head of this. What do you, you know, whatever. But then you get people like that know it's all about them. Someone that comes to mind that was at the summit that you were at is the uh, former director of Minneapolis St. Paul International Airports. I mean, he got in there, came from humble beginnings. Here he is, the big director, and he started right away. What what can I do to serve you listening? It took six months of listening around the airport before he really did much. And now, as many of us know, it's the best airport in North America and has been rated the top airport, uh, you know, for years. And now, you know, he's uh, he's moved on and consulting with airports in Seattle, Salt Lake and Copenhagen. But I think there's there's an example of someone um, proud of in Steve Wareham that, that lives that out. This is a really good setup. Go ahead, Joe. I want to just say one thing I'm thinking about because this is another little exercise for leaders on your impact time when you schedule impact time. I did this with uh, Grand Casino. Uh, It's a a big casino. They got two casinos in Minnesota. And I worked with their leaders and I said, I want you to go around and ask your people what their job is. And they would go around and say, well, uh, I'm a waiter. And I said, you have your comeback ready. No, you're not. You help nourish the soul. You give people great food and, and give them energy so they can go out and have some more fun. Well, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a pit boss. No, you're not. You're a, you know, so you, you give them value by, you know, cause a lot of times people say I'm in sales. No, you're not. What are you selling? Well, like the nine 11 people, you know, I I'm helping saving lives by trying to you know make sure everybody has this great GPS system we have, whatever the case might be. So, so as a leader, you can, you're, you're basically adding value to that person by telling them how important they are. What do they really do? Right. At the end of the day, yeah, I don't yeah. sell insurance. I give people, you know, let people sleep at night or, or give them freedom Perfect. or peace or 100%. whatever. Yeah. Well, before we get to the final question, we ask every time, Joe, hey, you you uh, still are anchoring uh, sports. You're still doing great interviews here, but you also spend a, a lot of time speaking, consulting, and equipping people. You're still writing. Uh, tell us, where can we find out more about Joe Schmidt? Um, I have a website, joeschmidt.com. That's uh, Schmidt with one T, no D, S-C-H-M-I-T. Uh, you know, I, I got the books and all that stuff available. Um, just call me. I put my own number on my website. How about that? <laughs> all and everybody, everybody, this will be in the in the show notes. If it's okay with you, we'll put your fo- phone number in the show notes, and uh, <laughs> and uh, we'll just we'll just do that. So, uh, JoeSchmidt.com, we get, get that and more. You'll have links to his great books and how to find more out about Joe. It is the Trusted Leader Show. Joe Schmidt, who is a leader you trust and why? Yeah, th- that's a really good question. But I, I think Mac, to me, the most trusted leader I've ever worked with and dealt with was uh, Tony Dungy. And Tony Dungy was the defensive coordinator of the Minnesota Vikings when he was here. He went on and uh, coached a couple of teams as the head coach and won a Super Bowl with the Indianapolis Colts. And uh, my personal library, I have all my favorite books right in front of me. And and one of the books he, he wrote is Uncommon. And it's and it's all about, you know, how can you be uncommon today? But Tony was a guy who walked the walk and talked the talk. And and Tony gave up a very lucrative coaching career so he could help 
he was trying to help the African-American men who maybe weren't the best fathers in the world. He was trying. He, he, he set his goals much bigger than just being a football coach once he accomplished that. But uh, as genuine and as real as they get, and uh, there's no phoniness there. And speaking of trust, um, <laughs> that, that's why Tony was a successful coach. People trusted him. Tony never yelled. Tony never swore. Yeah, this is a football coach, you know. He wasn't Vince Lombardi, I'll tell you that. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Uh, just recently, actually, was at the Uncommon Awards Banquet. It was treat Ben Roethlisberger is the uh, yeah. award this year, and um, it was uh, a treat to see them both. But Tony Dungy is a great example for all that know him. Joe, you're a great example. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for being my friend. And so it has been the Trusted Leader Show. Till next time, stay trusted.